Right, hi guys, welcome to my channel and around two years ago OpenAI released a new GPT model where they feed it with the images rather than the words that they did it previously. They also provide us with the really cool blog post with the visualizations. So as you can see we've got here a completions and the samples. So samples are generated without any input image, without any information previous information and completions are basically uh, the images cut in half and the model will generate the rest of the image. So what's really interesting about it that the model develops some sort of understanding of the scene and the objects in the image. So for me the best one is the one with the birds where model had to have some sort of understanding of the birds to generate the shape of them and also the understanding of the world around them so the scene that they occur so this relation from the object to the environment so that's really interesting also for me it's crazy that they, they generate the standing birds in a stain there's actually a reflection of the birds there this is some sort of understanding of the physics also you can see here there's uh, also the shadows of the person that walk so that's also really interesting and so in this video i, I want to share some insights about the model why the images are such a low resolution what's the general purpose of the model apart from completion of the image and what are the limitations of the model. Yeah, without further ado, let's get into it. So before we're gonna get to image GPT, I wanna take a step back and show you the progression of the GPT. So GPT-1 was released in 2018 and they feed the generative pre-training model. So it was 12 layers transformer and they feed it with 7,000 books. And the main objective of the model was to generate the next word. And then when they actually train it, they uh, did a fine tuning for certain tasks with the label or data sets and by using this generative pre-training it achieves state-of-the-art result. Okay so you might ask why we do generative pre-training. So first of all it reduced the need for large label data sets which is hard to obtain in real world situation and second of all it's a human-like way of learning so that's how we learn basically stuff we don't need to retrain our brain to for every situation we occur we basically used our gained knowledge previously right and we don't use a lot of examples of labels to actually understand some of the topics right so yeah that was the idea behind gpt1 and the gpt1 used the decoder architecture from the transformer they state in the paper that basically transformer is a flexible architecture because it's composed of the dense layers and as we know, dense layers can learn pretty much the image recognition, image classification, and so on. And they are built from these small neurons, uh, artificial neurons. And in a lot of cases, uh, Ilya Sutsky, a co-founder of the OpenAI, is actually talking about, he is actually comparing the artificial neurons to biological neurons. And he says that basically if we feed it with a lot of data, they're going to figure out a way how to solve the problem. So Transformer fits perfectly to this idea. And that's why they use it. And also transformer can f can be fed with any 1D sequence. So you can see, basically you can flatten the image and just feed it into it. And actually that's what they prove in this paper. This model can learn how to find the spatial, spatial relationship between pixels, which normally convolution do. Image GPT basically use the same architecture, but it's, it's actually fed with the images. So the idea is the same, we do the generative pre-training but we try to predict the next pixel of the image. So they use as an unlabeled data set ImageNet, so then later on they do fine-tuning or linear probing which we're gonna get to later uh, on three data sets, Cypher 10, Cypher 100 and STL. They introduced four models, they did it to basically show how the performance of the model increase with the size as they always do. So the main difference is basically the input resolution and as you can see the small, medium and large they pretty much the same 32 and 32. The XL is 64 and 64. It's still small resolution to be honest and it's mainly because the transformer is really sensitive to the input size. That's what they need to do with the image net. So the image net the input size is 224 times 224 and it's way too large for the input of the transformer. So we had to resize the input images to actually feed it to the transformer. They reshape it to 32 on 32 for, model, for these models. It's still a pretty big context window. So they also introduced a new thing which is called context reduction. What they did with the image, first of all we need to obviously resize it. Then we take a pixel from the image. It's obviously some sort of value. And then they got this 9-bit color palette that they find using the chi-means algorithm. And basically each of these um, index relate to the some sort of color. 
So this is, for example, light green, and this is thick white. And what we do, we basically calculate the Euclidean distance between the uh, cluster and the pixel. So then we pick the one cluster with the lowest distance to this pixel. Then we get our new image where we only got the indexes. And in this case, we reduce the input shape to only high times width. And also when we try to predict the image, we only predict one of these labels rather than three different values, right? So this is the context reduction that they introduced here. And now we can actually move to some details presented in the paper. The main idea is that we first of all use the context reduction, we take the image, we got our indexes for each cluster, the color, and when, then we perform the generative pre-training and we can do it in an autoregressive fashion. So basically it's the same as all of the GPTs did. We basically predict the next pixels or we do it in a bird fashion. So we mask some of the pixels and we try to predict the masked pixels. We later on get to how both of these perform. There's a and then we do either linear probe or fine tuning. So let me show you what's linear probing. The idea behind the linear probing is that we, instead of taking the last layer of the network, we take one of the layers in the middle and then we classify based on the features of that layer. So you might ask why we do it. And they actually state with generative pre-training, it's not obvious whether a task like pixel prediction is relevant to image classification. Obviously the farther you go in the network, so the last layers, all of these layers are specified to generate a pixel, not to extract certain features, right? But at the beginning of the network, the model is capturing this more global kind of feature. So that's why they tried this linear probing. And as you can see, in the 48 layer model, the best feature they extracted and the highest accuracy they achieved is when they took the features from around 20th layer. And they actually say this behavior potentially suggests that these generative models operate in two phases. In the first phase, each position gathers information from its surrounding context in order to build a more global image representation. That's what I said, basically we capture more global features. And in the second phase, this contextualized input is used to solve the conditional next pixel prediction task. So yeah, that's why they use the linear probing to actually achieve the classification results. And as you can see, it's outperformed some of the supervised models like ResNet 152 on C410, C400. So that's really good results. And they state that taking the final layer on C410 decreases performance by 2.4%. Okay, okay the, again, this shows that the size matter and the bigger model can perform better than the smaller ones. So what's fine tuning then? So fine tuning is basically retraining the whole model. So also I forgot to mention that XL model, so the biggest one, is not evaluated on Cypher 10 and Cypher 100. It takes, I think, bigger input and it's been trained on completely different data sets. Um, it's been trained on a, and it was not only trained on ImageNet in an unsupervised fashion, but it was also trained on 100 million images taken from internet that they were similar to ImageNet. And the problem with evaluation on ImageNet is that you need to downsample those images significantly. So they didn't achieve really good results when it comes to ImageNet at the end. They also didn't use any data augmentation techniques and they didn't use dropout, which is really interesting. Um, when it comes to the BERT against uh, autoregressive fashion, we see they see that autoregressive models produce much better features than BERT models after pre-training, but BERT models catch up after fine-tuning. In these settings, BERT Cypher 10 results are largely unchanged, but on ImageNet we gain almost 1% on our linear props and fine-tunes. Okay, so that's pretty much it what I want to talk about here. Um, I'm going to sh also share some of the conclusions from this paper. First of all, transformers are flexible domain agnostic architectures and what this paper shows that they can capture those spatial relationships in the relations in the image and can imitate the convolution in some sense. Also, the next thing is generative pre-training produce strong image representations. So it's also proved the point that basically we get that general knowledge from training on a large model on a large data sets and it gets that knowledge by optimizing the really simple objective function so predicting the next word and the next pixel so that's really interesting and another thing is utilization of this architecture requires a lot of data and compute so as we know from gpt3 and so on that these models requires enormous amount of data and compute to produce this really cool result. So the current architectures of Transformer cannot actually process higher resolutions. So that's a problem limitation and that's what 
probably we can work on later on. But yeah, that's the whole paper. So OpenAI this time actually released the whole code models and the weights for them. So in the next video, I want to show you how you can load the model, upload your own image and see how the model performs on your own. So yeah, stay tuned for the next video. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. In the last video, we took a closer look at the image GPT network. And since OpenAI released the whole weights for the model, I created a interactive notebook in Google Colab, which I wanna go through today. And I wanna explain what I changed in the code and how you can use it and generate your own images. All right, so first of all, you gotta go to my GitHub and go to my IGPT notebook repo. You gotta click the link IGPT notebook. So it's gonna take us to the collab. Pretty simple to use. You basically need to load all of this stuff, but I'm gonna explain it step by step. So first of all, we need to run this cell. It's pretty much just cloning the whole repo and install some of the libraries. It should take around a minute or something. Great, so we got our repo. On your left side, you should have IGPT folder here. I basically forked the image GPT repo by OpenAI and I changed some of the code, but I'm gonna get to it later. So then we can move to loading the model. So before we run this cell, we need to set how many batch we wanna use. All right, I forgot about it. So first, before we even close the, uh, the repo and install the dependencies, we gotta change the runtime to GPU. Okay, so that's how we actually can run this big network. After that, we basically go to load, to the, load the model. Before we run this cell, we need to set the batch. So the batch is basically the number, how many images we want to complete or generate from scratch. So I set it to two, because obviously the more batches you, the more images you set, the longer it takes to generate them. Uh, second of all, you can choose the model size. Um, I recommend stick to S, because the other ones um, don't generate such a plausible images. I guess it's because when they train it, they train all of the models to one checkpoint. So obviously the smaller model could learn much more in the, sa in the same time as the larger model. So that's probably why I would stick to the S. I know the L can run on the free GPU also, but I don't know how many batches you can do. I set it to eight, but even on the S, it's gonna take a while to actually generate. So let's run it and it should take around five minutes to actually load the model. All right, it's actually take less than five minutes. It was like around a minute. So it's cool. And then we can move to loading and pre-processing the image. So obviously I think we all wanna, uh, we wanna do a completion of the image rather than generating a new one. So what we start with is we need to add the image we want to complete. So first of all, okay, so let me load the image. I have the Michael Scott image and we gotta put it in there. We have it here. And then we need to put the name of the image. There you go. And let's see how it looks like. Okay, so we have our image. It's the progression that we made from the original image to the ones that we're gonna pass to the model. First of all, we crop the image automatically and it changed it to the 32 and 32. That's the only size of the image that the model can load. Okay, so it's changed it to 32 and 32. And we basically crop a part of image that we want to complete. So you can change how many pixels you want to crop here. If you set it to 10, it's gonna generate, it's gonna only crop from the bottom uh, 10 pixels. So in our case, I would set it to yeah, around 16. Yeah, that's maybe 14, 15 would be nice. Um, okay, so let's say that's what we want and then we can save it. So then we have the pre-process Scott. Okay, the last thing we do is basically pass these to the model. You wanna save the results, the completions, you just need to click on it, we should save them. Okay, so let's run the cell. It should take also five minutes, I think. We only have two images, so it might be shorter than this. All right, so we got the results, but if you look at these images, uh, they look pretty cool. Still it's a, you know, 32 and 32 resolution, but it took, like around an hour to actually generate it. It depends what kind of GPU you get from the collab. This times I got a pretty slow one. Normally it takes around like 10, 15 minutes. 
I'd say. Yeah, it just depends what you get. I want to show you exactly now what I changed in the code and how I made it more uh, usable. If you look at the the repo published by OpenAI, you basically, um, the interaction with the code is by using the command line. You pretty much need to run it, everything from command line, which is not easy actually to interact with, right? You can see downloading the model requires uh, different variables. So what I basically did is just simplify it. So you just clone dependency, load the model. So I did like the whole information included there about the models. Um, the checkpoint model size and it's easy to interact you just basically uh, drag these and so I actually took some of the functions from the um, from the original repo but I redefined them here color quantimes so it's basically assigned every pixel to cluster so we get nine bit clusters there also reverse function so cluster to pixel if we generate image we want to convert it to pixels and pre-processing so whenever you load the image here first of all it's a bit to the to the squared image then resize it to 32 and 32 normalize it and convert it to our 9-bit color palette so also i added this option so if you want to crop the image you just basically uh, set the number of the pixel you want to crop right so it's just easy to interact and that's what lacked in the original repo it didn't have the it only generate the new images it couldn't generate the completion of the image so the original code doesn't have it. I changed it in the source uh, file. When you have the main function and you get the sample function, which basically generates a new image, I add this parameter, which is called primer. So we pass this primer, which is um, cropped image. It calculates the attention scores, including already the primer. So yeah, that's the changes I made. Also, as I said, the interactions was the interaction with the code was via um, terminal. So I changed the arg arguments as a separate. As you can see, you can change the parameters if you want. If you have more GPU and you use it on your PC, you can change it here. And I saw different notebooks when you can use GPU, call up GPU, but they were pretty. Um, they were. I would say harder to interact with. And that's it for this video. Um, as always, if you have any question or request about the paper, just leave a comment down below. And if you enjoy that kind of videos, just leave a like. And if you're new to the channel, hit the subscribe button. And yeah, see you in the next video.